be an incredibly healthy move. So it is now uh, two o'clock in my part of the world, one o'clock in Chicago, where some of us may in fact be. And so um, we're going to move to, uh, as we've been doing in the business meeting, this meeting of the last couple of years has uh, split between uh, programming the business meeting, which we just finished, and having usually presentations by speakers on topics that um, intersect with the question of libraries and academics in interesting ways. Uh, in some sense, I think if we're going to have this meeting at something like the AIA SCS, we should really probably take that opportunity to think about um, you know, how can we foster greater communication and collaboration between academics and librarians. Um, that happens all the year, but this is a, a special forum in which to have it. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, two presenters today. Uh, the first is Barbara Rokenbach, who is the university librarian. Um, it's a chaired 1968, I can't remember the exact title, Barbara, it will be on Barbara's deck, but uh, she is the university librarian at Yale University. She has a long history in the humanities and research librarian, uh, libraries, having worked at JSTOR and then at Columbia for numerous years, uh, and now finally at Yale. So, uh, and I, I met Barbara a long time ago, and I can say without a doubt that one of the reasons I am now in libraries is because of Barbara. So uh, it great, gives me great pleasure to, to have her come speak to this group. Um, the person responding to Barbara, I've, I've, I've never met, but an equally impressive uh, person, Simon Neem, who is the university or the Dean of Libraries, I believe it is at UMass Amherst, who uh, also has a long history in libraries, uh, having done interesting things uh, at, I think it was UBC, before arriving at Amherst, where uh, um, UMass Amherst, where he's been the Dean since 2016. Uh, both of our guests uh, run large and have had experience in large uh, institutions that uh, are on the forefront of thinking about the intersection of education and research and teaching and libraries um, that have interesting centers and digitization projects. And so it was, it was a reason I, I thought that they might speak to us because we are now, we've just gone through, um, right, oh, um, so, uh, sorry, I, I have a message from Jim O'Donnell. Jim can join no matter what. Um, I will get to you in a moment, Jim, uh, if you can't log in. So, um, you know, we've just gone through a year of trem tre tremendous transition, having to switch on the fly uh, to teaching and uh, thinking about how to provide resources for uh, the humanities and ancient studies. This has also uh, highlighted the need to open up our resources even beyond perhaps our institutional walls as COVID has uh, illuminated uh, vast uh, inequalities in our society, uh, in the, in the, at least in the United States. And so I think we really need to ask, what is the new normal going forward? What, what will we take with us from this sort of emergency footing? Or what has the effect of COVID been? What can we expect? What may or may not go back to normal? What, what, are, what, what should we think of as we're moving our libraries into the 21st century increasingly? And I can think of no better people to discuss this than, than Barbara and uh, Simon. So Barbara will begin um, and she has, uh, put together a, a bit of a deck. So she'll have a more formal presentation and then Simon will offer his thoughts from his perspective afterwards. And I hope the last 20 minutes will be, um, will be question and answer. And I can say the one thing that I think is uh, really fantastic is that through no fault of my own, when they asked me a couple of months ago, um, when they asked me a, a couple of months ago, if I could provide a Zoom link, I said, sure. And it turns out that means that I can invite the entire world to listen to Barbara and, uh, and Simon. And uh, I hope that's something that the SCS and AAA do carry into our future as a new normal, that we can have programming both, you know, we can figure out the economics and organization of having programming for people who belong to the society, but also take this new platform that we have to speak to the entire world about the importance of the work that we do. So with that, um, I'm really excited to have Barbara take over. And I believe she's already co-host. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Hopefully I'm unmuted. Good. Excellent. Well, David, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's um, I, I'm remembering that day in 2011 when you came into my office at, um, in, at Columbia. I think you were still a student then. And uh, 
I knew you had the stuff of a librarian. We just had to get you get you convinced of it. So great to, to have you here. And thank you so much for this invitation. I'm going to try something I've not done before, which is I'm going to share my screen, but part of my screen. So give me one second. Um, because I need to have my notes in front of me. So give me a second. Hopefully this will work. A YouTube video showed me how to do this this morning. So I think this is going to work. Okay. Um, at this point, can you just see my slides? Oh, probably not. Is that right? Yes. I'm getting yes. a thumbs up. No notes, just slides. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I And uh, to start off with this, some reflections on COVID 2020 in academic libraries. As David mentioned, I'm uh, the university librarian at Yale, relatively new. I've only been in this position about six months. And so I'm really thrilled that Simon is here because he has been in the role of Dean of Libraries at UMass Amherst for I think just over four years. And so we'll be able to speak to you of, uh, with, about the experience of leading a library both before a pandemic and during a pandemic. Um, I'm also thrilled to see Lots of my former colleagues from Columbia, um, from our list days, and also many colleagues from Yale. So thank you all to, um, for being here today. Uh, so I just want to start off by saying that these reflections and ideas are coming from a place of privilege. And I want to acknowledge that right away, that um, Yale's resources, while affected by the pandemic, have remained strong. And I feel very well supported at this time. Having said that, what I wanna to talk to you all about today are the things that I've learned about the role of an academic library and the value of an academic library um, in the moment of a pandemic. And I think it's really a time where the value of libraries is being reimagined. Regardless of financial resources or your level of constraint, I think the pandemic has helped me see more clearly the essential role of the library, especially for the humanities disciplines. I want to share some ideas about how you as faculty and librarians can help the library both survive and thrive during this time. So let's see if I can advance this. Um, okay, there we go. Sorry, all. I'm going to get this eventually. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to show this image. I love this image. This was taken at the beginning of uh, the school year of um, the, the Yale Bulldog with a mask on in front of Sterling. And I found it really symbolic and compelling that this was uh, the place that the university chose to, to put this image right, um, right in front of the library where lots of people felt that in many ways the, the library was the heart of the university this semester, given it was one of the only things that was open. Um, and so with this image, I just want to start out with a few observations about service spaces and collections during the pandemic. And much of what I will talk about today are changes in the library landscape that I think were already beginning pre-pandemic, but have been accelerated by a need that all of us have had to respond quickly and decisively to meet user needs in a remote environment. Um, I'm sure, though, there are examples of things happening in your libraries that would never have happened pre-pandemic. One such ex example is that Yale is now doing a mail-to-home service where we mail books and journals to anywhere in the United States. And this has been such a popular service and, and relatively inexpensive. Demand has been high, but not so high that we haven't been able to afford this. I imagine that we'll continue this post-pandemic, that this is one of those things that if people want to use our print books, let's, let's get them into their hands. And so this is something that I think we will continue. And I, I look forward in the discussion to hear about things that you may not have imagined before the pandemic, but now may be real lasting changes in your libraries. In terms of what I think has been accelerated, there's three areas that immediately come to mind. The first is a need for and the practice of sharing collection acquisition or collection development and discovery across institutions. The move to a more open information environment and the work of the library and how we do that work being deeply informed by diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'll talk about these changes more after a few smaller observations. Uh, we at Yale have discovered that student-facing activities work very well online. I saw some of my Yale colleagues here, and I think they would, they would concur that our virtual wor workshops, coffees, or what we call our latte with a librarian events, and other forms of student engagement 
has been really very good. We've seen higher attendance in this kind of engagement online than we have in person. We've also received many requests for research methods classes embedded in courses. So this has us thinking about outreach engagement in new ways that will have lasting effects. Across libraries, we've also reconsidered what we measure and how we measure things. Um, I'm sure all of you used to spend a lot of time thinking about attendance and circulation in your libraries. Now we are seeing a more outcome-based mindset rather than counting library visits and collection use. We are thinking about different metrics for measuring success. This is an important growth area. And I know some libraries, particularly libraries, public libraries or public institutions have, have thought a lot about measures for student success, academic excellence, and, um, and, the, and other ways to measure the impact of library interventions in the academy. So I think this is gonna be an area that we're gonna be doing a lot of thinking about in, um, in the coming years. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, but I think it bears repeating, across research libraries, there's increased focus on issues of equity with students that are both in-person, remote, and learning in very different environments than they have in the past. This is true of faculty, but I think in particular, we are thinking a lot about equity for students in this moment. So I wanna share these themes um, about libraries uh, now and in the post-pandemic world. And I'm gonna focus in a couple areas. Libraries place, both physical and virtual, the scholarly communication landscape and new forms of scholarship and training. So let me advance here. So library is place. Um, it is clear that the library's place is essential in this moment. And what I mean by library is place is the power of library spaces to bring people together in a community, as a community in a moment of great isolation and disconnection. So I've already mentioned that um, we reopened our libraries uh, this fall. We opened on August 31st after the spaces and buildings were closed for over five months. Now the, the library was not closed by any stretch of the imagination. Our buildings were closed, but the library was open. And this is important to note because I imagine your libraries were also open online. Online consultations, online reference, collections increasingly moving online. And so this sense of being open, even when our spaces are not, will be important when we think about libraries post pandemic. I think there are a lot of services that have migrated online, as I've already mentioned, that, um, that will be will continue to be something that we will want to um, focus on and, and grow in um, post-pandemic times. Now, this does not mean that we'll deprecate the in-person experience or the in-building experience. It just means that faculty and students have discovered ways that online experiences support their research, learning, and teaching. So what you're looking at here is our uh, contactless book pickup in what we call the Sterling Nave. This is uh, the library um, on central campus. And this was our way of ensuring that people who needed access to physical books were able to do it. Uh, our first contactless book pickup opened in a space that was not inside a library. It was actually in a, an adjacent cafe and then moved into the space. And I, I bring this up because I can say that our students and faculty have missed books. And I'm, I'm curious what you're all hearing, um, if, if physical books and journals and materials have been, have been missed and the kinds of ways you've addressed that. Um, the Yale Library, as I've said, has delivered print books to addresses. We've been delivering books to, um, to dorm rooms. So during our student quarantine this fall, we uh, delivered books to the, the dorm rooms to sort of, as we said, you know, the, your quarantine brought to you by the Yale Library. There are, are there lots of things that you can do uh, from your dorm room, streaming video, streaming Met Opera, um, and have books delivered to you so that students knew that the library was still present for them. Um, we reopened our special collections reading rooms in August as well to enable students and faculty to use our uh, uh, to use those collections. And that has been, I think, incredibly important. Um, I think all of you agree that um, electronic resources have been critical to this moment. Um, but I think we also really did miss print, particularly in the humanities. So I say all of this to acknowledge that while we have learned that print may be even more important than we thought pre-pandemic, I do believe that this period has accelerated the shift to electronic. Print will may continue to be a preferred approach for humanists, but electronic will be prominent and making an argument for print will be more difficult in the coming years. Uh, the, for instance, the Yale Library has moved to an e-preferred 
collection policy right now in this moment, and this is really about equity, making sure that people who are remote will have access to the same resources uh, that those on campus will. We'll revisit that e-preferred policy, but this is accelerating. And so having said that, e-books and resources are currently not meeting humanist research needs. I think we all know that. Um, the interfaces are poor, the functionality is limited, content in many fields, such as art history, is lacking in electronic format. I actually had the chance to talk to Ken Soner, the head of the Met Library this morning, and he told me that um, they are buying everything they can in electronic format, and that's really 400 to 500 e-books a year in art history. I don't know what your experience is if you're in the arts, but that's that's not a lot of content uh, in the e-format. And so I ask that we work together now and post pandemic to help improve these resources rather than fighting against them. I ask that you help the library think about improving um, the interfaces. I'll, I'll bring up one such example that some of you may know about the e, Simply E initiative, which is funded by the IMLS and is uh, run by the New York Public Library, is really an initiative to look at improving the academic ebook experience. And if this is our future reality, I think we all have to work together to make sure that this is, this is a good reality for, for us. Uh, libraries as space um, are usually central to campus. And as you know, over the past several decades, these spaces have been altered in many ways to acknowledge a decline in print use. And I just wanna give you a few statistics about that so we can talk about activating our, our spaces in, in new and um, I think innovative ways. So as we've reduced campus collections, um, I think you've probably done this on campus collection reduction to acknowledge the decrease in print use. And I'll give you the, some statistics from Yale. From 2004 uh, through 2018, undergraduate circulation declined by 46%. The number of checkouts by graduate students was down 20%, and facu faculty circulation dropped even more at 31%. So user experience is telling us that there's a declining use of print. Now, we need to, to think about what that means in terms of the post-pandemic. I think simply relying on our missing print is not going to be a, an argument to get people back into our spaces. And the good news is for the last several decades, libraries have really activated their spaces in innovative ways and in creative ways. Um, and things I'm thinking about are um, the ways that we uh, have events in our libraries where we, we have kind of points of, of creativity. And I'll talk in a bit about um, the Digital Humanities Lab here in the, the Yale Libraries. One such example of a space where people can use the library and the resources here in a much more active and creative way. But um, one thing I want to appeal to, to all of you, if you're faculty in particular, is to think of the library and, the, and librarians as partners in, in your academic enterprise, that our spaces are excellent for hosting book talks, for inviting speakers, for graduate students to, to speak about their work. And the way that that is beneficial to you and to libraries is our ability to help um, think about the interdisciplinary nature of our spaces and how um, our expertise in libraries can be critical to enhancing your your events with collection support, um, expertise in new tools for research and scholarship, um, expertise on copyright and intellectual property advice, and ways to really increase the dissemination of your scholarly output. That the, that the library as place is a place for events, but also a place to activate scholarship in new and creative ways. So I wanna just give you one quick example from Columbia and, um, and, and Nick and, and, and others from Columbia will know this example well. So uh, in 2017, right after the hurricane, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, the Columbia libraries thought about ways that we could really help with the um, hurricane relief efforts and, and with a lens of th thinking about social justice. The library is a site of social justice. And so we held, uh, this was a brainchild of our digital humanities team and, and a lot of faculty on campus. We held a mapathon, which was essentially a call to action to have faculty and students on campus come to the library, bring your own laptops, and essentially learn to georectify using OpenStreetMap the points of um, on, on 
on uh, the map of Puerto Rico, essentially to help with relief efforts, help the Red Cross with these important efforts. And why I love this example, though one that's old, older in time, is that it's it's about rapid response. It's, it's about the library, but it's also about the fact the library is what I like to say libraries classroom, the ability for the expertise held in the library around GIS, our map collections, um, our technological expertise being brought to bear on something that had a real impact on the, um, the situation in Puerto Rico, but also was a training opportunity for students and for faculty. This is the kind of thing I think post pandemic we're going to want to think a lot about. So I want to talk a bit about collections. How am I doing, David, on time? I've got, okay. I think you're doing fine. So we Excellent. have 40 okay. more minutes, so. Excellent, all right. Um, so thinking about um, collections and really scholarly communication, I want to talk about the themes I mentioned right at the start, and that is the need for and practice of sharing collection development and discovery across institutions and a move to a more inform open information environment. So um, for a couple of years now, I've served on an Ivy Plus Scholarly Communication Task Force. And this summer, we hosted a series of, we called it the Summer of SCALCOM. And the reason was we felt that this is a really big scholarly communication moment for libraries, that the pandemic has accelerated and probably even catalyzed in some ways, some new ways of thinking about the scholarly communica communication landscape because we so quickly had to pivot, not only to to online resources, um, but we had to think about supporting courses in new ways. And so it sent us thinking about ways to open up um, our collections via, when we could via licensing, um, I'm sure many of you have the ETOS, the Emergency Temporary Access through the Hathi Trust, that there were a lot of ways we thought creatively as a community about fulfilling our mission, our mission to get resources in the hands of faculty and students to support teaching, research, and learning. And, um, and so that le led us to very quickly think about the scholarly communication landscape and, and some of the limitations of a landscape that has really been marked by paywalls. And how could we figure out ways to, um, to work with that, that landscape to support our, our needs? And so I think this is really a call for us to, to think about how there will be some lasting changes around the way we think about intellectual property, the way we license resources, and how we can move to a more open landscape. This is going to require partnerships, clearly, with, with publishing, um, the publishing industry and others. But this was a moment where we realized we weren't able to do what we needed to do because of some of the limitations of the SCALCOM landscape. Um, I think also important to note is um, the fact that of open science, and I know we're a, a lot of humanists here, but I think open science is pointing the way for us here a little bit when we think about the fact that to advance on a COVID vaccine and to understand the, um, the things we needed to understand with COVID, the, the, um, that scholarship needed to be made available immediately. And so the, ish, the um, availability of preprint servers, of accelerating the peer review process, all of these things we saw could, could change rapidly. And um, I think this is really important for us to note. So I bring up open science for another reason, and that is because I think it's a moment for us in libraries and for faculty to place some bets in the SCALCOM landscape. And what I mean by that is, if we want a more open and equitable future for scholarship, there are many models out there for open access and op open scholarship. And we've seen them. We've seen open access be co-opted by the um, commercial publishers as a, um, as, a, as a business model. Um, and I think we need to think about placing some bets on some of these models to see what will have some lasting effect. And one such model that we're interested in in Yale, and I don't want to say that I'm, I'm you know, promoting a particular product here by talking about PLOS, the Public um, Library of Science, but I do think that this is a good example of some creativity happening in this moment. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with PLOS, it was founded in 2001 as a nonprofit to really um, accelerate progress in science and medicine through um, open publishing of, um, of, re of research. PLOS was the originator of the idea of the APC, the um, article processing charge. So when we've seen APCs, it really started with PLOS. Now over the last 20 years, I think we've come to realize that APCs, there are equity issues with APCs. The fact that we're asking our scholars to pay 
to, to, to help with um, supporting the publishing landscape. And we see this play out that researchers who have money, who have grant funds, who have research funds, researchers in the global north um, tend to have a greater ability to publish in open journals on an APC model. And this is a real equity issue that needs to be addressed. And so PLOS has rethought that model and in essence is putting forward a model just released this spring that will um, basically have libraries subsidizing this, pay, paying for publication on our campus for these articles rather than having the burden on our individual scholars. This is brand new. We're trying it out here. I'm excited to see where it goes, but this is what I mean about placing bets. I think we're willing to, um, to place a bet on this and see if this is, is a model forward. For the humanities, I want to talk about um, one piece of the scholarly communication landscape that I sure, I'm sure many of you are aware of, but this is uh, sort of near and dear to my heart because Columbia was a very early supporter and partner in um, the humanities, commons, and core. We were, uh, we were a PI on a, an NEH grant early on with MLA and Kathleen Fitzpatrick on this particular um, uh, repository. So it's an open access repository that is for humanities. And why I think this is important is when we think about smaller humanistic disciplines, you know, there's archive. Um, physics has their preprint repository, right? Small humanities disciplines should not and will not develop its own, their own repositories. This is the power of aggregation through the um, a humanities repository like the MLA Commons. And um, what this is in essence is a repository for open scholarship. It is also a social repository, meaning that there are uh, groups here to um, help foster scholarly communication around the materials openly available in core. And um, this began with the MLA, uh, has now expanded to the Association for Slavic, Eastern European and Eurasian Studies the Association of Jewish Studies and the College Art Association um, and is further evolving as Kathleen Fitzpatrick has moved to Michigan State and there's some new, new thinking about this. But I just bring this up as a great example of ways in which um, things have, have be, where a repository is available for humanists and where open scholarship can be realized. Um, I want to finish the collections piece on uh, new forms of scholarship and training. Uh, the, sh the sharing of collection development and discovery has also been accelerated during COVID. And I'm sure many of you at your institutions are participating in collaborative collection development and thinking innovatively about how we stretch our collection dollars to be able to, as, to, to, to partner with institutions to ensure our scholars have access to the kinds of resources we need, maybe not ownership of, but access to. And a few initiatives that Yale's participated in is the Ivy Plus Brazilian collaboration with nine in institutions within Ivy Plus to cover Brazilian monographs. Um, another is a Harvard-Yale uh, Mexican Collaborative Collection Development Agreement where we're distributing the coverage of Mexican materials um, around geographic regions. So again, making sure we have access to these materials, but really stretching our collection dollars by getting a copy for, the, for multiple institutions and then using the collection dollars to perhaps buy materials we otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, so I think with collection budget cuts, we need to think about collections through this lens of, of, of access rather than just um, ownership. So um, finally, because I realize I'm at 20 minutes here, new forms of scholarship and training. I just want to end with some ideas about ways that we can think about how COVID has accelerated existing trends in digital humanities, digital scholarship, uh, computational methods, because so much of what we're doing now is has migrated online, right? And so we've, we've all I think probably accelerated our digitization of our analog collections to support courses. Um, some of you will be familiar, familiar with the notion of collections as data. This is a Mellon kind of coined term, but has really, I think, benefited our libraries to think about all the collections that we own and steward in digital form, our, our collections as data. And so thinking about ways that that type of digitization can lead to new forms of scholarship 
And libraries, I think, really are at the heart of facilitating not only that kind of new form of scholarship, but the training necessary, the new literacies that are important for faculty and for students to be able to take advantage of some of the new tools and methods in this area. And in particular, I, I want to appeal to all of you to think about how libraries are um, could be or maybe already are in some cases a site of real professional development for graduate students that libraries have invested in staff expertise over the last decade or two in hiring staff who understand new tools and methods in the research landscape and that we're very well positioned to train graduate students in these tools and methods not only to enhance academic careers but also to enhance broader career opportunities and so i think now and post pandemic thinking about joint fundraising and grant opportunities with faculty and librarians around graduate training is going to be a real area of opportunity for us um, so I've just got a couple of quick slides here of the, the, um, the Yale's Frankie um, Digital Humanities Lab, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to, to activate our spaces and provide um, spaces for creativity and innovation in our libraries. And again, these new forms of digital scholarship. So um, I think just to, to conclude here, post pandemic libraries have the ability to be at the center of campus to foster community collaboration and creativity. I hope humanists will partner with making this, vis this vision possible um, and really help us activate collections, our spaces, think about the scholarly communication landscape differently, and um, really work with us to, to make the case that the library is, is more vibrant than ever. And um, it may not be the library of several decades ago, but I think it is an incredibly vibrant place that um, really has a lot of opportunities for us post pandemic. So I'm gonna wrap up there and turn it over to Simon. And, and just before Simon begins, um, if you could hold questions to the end, uh, that would be great uh, because that way I can be sure to get to, to, Rebecca and I can get to all of your questions. Um, and the, the two ways to do it, you can either put a question directly into the chat and we can ask it or the speakers can respond to it. Or if you want to ask it live, just you know, put the word question in and we'll just go in order. Thank you. Simon. Great, thank you. I think I'm off mute here. Um, thank you, uh, Barbara. And uh, that's a great um, overview. Barbara and I uh, did not coordinate our, um, we, we kept it very authentic. So we did not coordinate our, uh, our responses. So, but I can say, um, Many of what Barbara has said in the last uh, half hour has, has really um, resonated with me and certainly was in uh, a good part of it was in uh, some of my thoughts and remarks. Um, I'm really pleased to be here uh, today with this group and, and I'm just going to share uh, and I think some of this will be coming from my perspective uh, at a public uh, land grant institution like UMass. Um, surprisingly is really going to echo uh, a lot of Barbara has said, so I apologize. I, I'm not gonna talk for too long because I'm really excited to get to the questions uh, and hear from all of you and, and be able to respond a little bit directly. Um, I guess one of the first things I just wanna emphasize too is that, you know, we're not, we're not, this is an interesting moment to have this conversation. I'd love to come back in a year uh, and, and hopefully post pandemic uh, when we do reach that, that moment. Um, so that we can really see what we are speculating um, about will, will be the new normal um, after the pandemic. I know that we're still in the midst of things and so it's sometimes hard to know, uh, but we're seeing some signs definitely and, and much of what Barbara's talked about, I think the pandemic uh, has really hastened some of the changes already underway. Um, since before the pandemic started. And, and we know the increased use of eBooks, uh, digital surrogates, um, online resources, and, and a growing number of online services. And perhaps that's where uh, I've really noticed um, much more uptake uh, in, in the use of online services. And a lot of what we did in person, uh, we have been doing online through our librarians providing workshops, instruction sessions, as well as, um, 
as one-on-one -on -one support through things like chat reference, the numbers have been really um, uh, growing and increasing. And I'll also add that our own internal use of virtual um, gatherings, uh, such as staff professional development and, um, and even just meetings, uh, um, all staff meetings, the uptake has been um, really, uh, uh, incredible to see. We, we have had the highest attendance uh, in a lot of these areas than we ever did in, in the sort of physical only realm. So um, I think some of that will definitely continue. Um, it makes it a lot easier for our staff to, uh, to participate across all um, levels of the organization. You know, it's been said a lot, and I'll just say again quickly, I think as a unit on campus, um, libraries everywhere have really shown um, themselves to be incredibly adaptable um, as our institution shifted to remote learning uh, uh, way back this past spring. And I think we really have demonstrated the value of investing in a digital infrastructure and content over the last you know, two decades or more. Um, this was kind of obvious, but I think even senior leadership of our institutions have really appreciated how adaptable um, libraries have been um, as, we, as we have been trying to deal with, with the pandemic. That's not to say, and, and, and Barbara highlighted this too, that this, the pandemic has definitely highlighted issues of inequality, uh, both for our faculty and students around access to reliable internet connections, as well as um, access to appropriate technology for, for both working and, and for learning. Um, and within the libraries uh, here at UMass, we have uh, employees who are part of many different uh, collective agreements, bargaining agreements, and we've really seen, I think, a lot of inequalities surface um, between who really can work remotely and who, um, whose roles are really on site. And, um, and just dealing with some of that going forward, I think, is going to be really important because it's going to be uh, a cultural uh, and workplace culture uh, issue that that needs to be really thought uh, carefully about um, and dealt with. Um, I expect that going uh, post pandemic, one of the things we've all been thinking about is how much how much will we be working remotely and, and what will that look like uh, post pandemic? I think it's a little early to say, um, but I, I'm already seeing uh, the notion of the institution itself, the university, really thinking about um, how much remote instruction will remain after, um, after the pandemic and how much uh, will it, um, how much will the, the on-campus experience matter? UMass is a very highly residential uh, college. And so the students themselves have been really um, asking and hoping that they can have that residential on-site experience when the pandemic is over. Uh, but but it doesn't always translate to wanting to take all the courses in person. And that also goes with accessing a lot of services and resources. Sometimes that on-campus experience is also met with peer-to-peer -peer interactions, um, co-curricular activities, and also just the, um, the uh, the interactions and learning and networking that happens by being on a campus. So even though we're sensing uh, a huge uh, pent up demand to return to campus, it doesn't mean that all the services and, and activities that we have been doing remotely will automatically shift back uh, to in person. And what that mix looks like, I think is gonna be something we won't know until till we're there. I just think it's gonna be a really interesting um, period. So, you know, the university is thinking about uh, a much more flexible and, and um, a, a much more robust teach, remote teaching experience going forward, but also a much more flexible definition around what a semester means, what an academic year means, uh, and all of these things. So I think we're going to see um, an important role for libraries as part of that, both that digital remote experience, learning experience, but also as part of that on-campus experience. And I know our students are really excited to um, just to return to be in spaces uh, like the libraries because it really inspires them to, um, to work and to feel like they're having a, a true university experience. Um, 
I think Barbara has really talked, uh, uh, just said so much uh, that resonates with me around collections too. So I don't wanna repeat too much of that. Uh, I will say that um, this has been a real time for um, I think open education and open access resources to really shine. Uh, we have found that when we shifted to a digital online reserve or e-reserve only uh, and shifted completely away from print reserves. Um, I should add very quickly that the libraries at UMass have not reopened at all uh, as, a, as a physical space. We, of course, have been open. And it's a great point uh, that I make a lot. Uh, I think everyone's heard me so much now that they even the chancellor uh, repeats this. Uh, we have never closed. We've remained open. Our staff have remained 100% uh, engage with uh, supporting the, the UMass students and faculty, but our physical spaces have yet to open and they will likely reopen on February 1st, but we've been very cautious um, about that. The only access that we have provided by appointment has been to special collections and university archives for obvious reasons, um, and that has gone uh, really, really well. Um, but what I will say is, uh, you know, our, our our collections, our um, curbside pickup, our direct mail to users, um, all of that has been really, really well received. And the amount of uptake in those services has actually surprised us. So I think just to talk about a very continued hybrid environment where in some disciplines, people have really still appreciated, even if they can't browse for the material, having access to those physical items has been really um, well appreciated. That said, um, our Hadi Trust use of the um, ETAS service has been, uh, has been growing exponentially, especially since the spring. Um, and for us, it covers, I, we estimate about 50% of our physical stacks um, have been available. So, and again, users have been responding, uh, faculty and graduate students in particular, um, even if it's not the absolute preferred uh, way of accessing those books, the ability to do that, and once they learn how to do that, um, I, I think they've really, uh, um, you know, uh, appreciate it. And I, I think we'll want that usage to continue, uh, whether it can or not, uh, it's hard to say. Um, I'll add quickly, for those who don't know, UMass Amherst is really embedded collection-wise, especially for our print collections in the five colleges, along with Amherst College, Smith College, Mount Holyoke, and Hampshire Colleges. So uh, we've kept that sharing of materials um, going between the colleges as best we can over the entire pandemic period. And that has also allowed us to continue to provide access to an enormous um, physical collection between the five um, institutions. Um, but I'll just say quickly, uh, open ed resources. So even as we've moved to um, electronic textbooks, uh, electronic reserves, the um, ability to access e-textbooks have been really challenging from a public perspective. And so um, the opportunity here, uh, we've been working with our Center for Teaching and Learning and our instructional design team in IT to form kind of a SWAT team around helping faculty to build um, uh, course materials with open materials. And that has led to um, a whole new wave of adoption, which I think has been a plus side of this, this otherwise really quite um, terrible situation we've all been in. So I think that's going to continue and that momentum is going to continue uh, in terms of supporting open education and open access resources. And I'll just end by saying that um, in terms of our services, one of the things we have really noticed in addition to obviously the need to work even harder at discovery and um, Barbara made the great example of eBooks. Um, I think we all face uh, a lot of those challenges and also just in our own, um, our own websites and how we realized how inadequate our website was in really focusing uh, from a user perspective on the services that were available. Our websites are still too designed as a virtual representation of the physical library. This department does this, this department does that. We had to really pivot quickly in a very crude way and try to gather what people wanted and put it together. And now we're building uh, a new website based on this whole experience because we realize the user is not at the center of our current virtual experience. We're expecting them to learn too much about us and it's irrelevant for them. Um, and this really comes into play when we talk about supporting digital scholarship and new forms of publishing. We really need to put 
those services out in front and worry about how we support those behind the scenes. That's our, our business to worry about. And we've, we've, we're making the users do too much work around that. So that's been a big takeaway. Uh, and I would imagine a, a great lesson for us going forward that will continue. So I'm gonna pause because I don't wanna take up all the time for, uh, for questions, but um, I, I would just say, you know, really echoing um, so much of what Barbara had to say. And even though we're two very different institutions, um, it's amazing how similar our experiences have been uh, across research libraries in general. Uh, thank you. Uh, so many points to, to respond to and questions, questions I could ask that I've written down. Um, but I would like to give, uh, since we have 15 minutes, I, I certainly want to give uh, precedence to people who would like to ask questions. Um, so if you have a question, you know, feel free to write the word question in the chat and then I can just call your name and you can simply speak. Um, or uh, you can put, um, you could put, um, I, or you can put your question into the chat. So I know that it, in the chat right now, there has been, uh, you know, th there's been one comment about the Hathi Trust, uh, which has been plus one by somebody in terms of its near uselessness. And I guess I am interested. Uh, I know that even in my own environment, some people really love it and some people really hate it. And I'm, I guess the two questions uh, that I suppose could be taken away from, from this comment about Hathi is, uh, what is it when people do find it really useful? What, what exactly, it, do we need to think about Hathi you know, it's a usefulness and just checking the one thing you can get the page to, or people, is there really a learning curve and people learning how to use it better? And it's really, um, and, and is there any money or impetus for Hathi to invest? Certainly the interface could be better. Uh, there's just no doubt about that. Is there, is one of the things coming out of this and, and the fact that uh, it seems to have such promise that there is going to be an investment from the Hathi group in making these materials more accessible, or is there impetus to help clear more rights or something? Um, if you could speak a bit more about Hathi, because you're right, it, for many people, it has been a lifeline. For other people, it's been um, an infernal frustration. Yeah, I'll just jump in quickly, but Simon, I'd be curious to hear what your experience has been. We have had a lot of good feedback about the avail availability of, of um, books in Hathi, um, but also realizing that that it, it it isn't a great user experience, but I think when you have nothing, <laughs> it was just, it was really helpful for people to have the content. Um, I do think that that Hati will be thinking very differently going forward about what they invest in, in terms of interface and user experience. Um, and I think we all have a role in advocating for that because um, I, I, I have heard such good things about it but also recognizing that um, that there's some improvements to be made. So I don't know, Simon. What are you What are you hearing about? And I, I wish I knew more about specific uses, but I don't know that much. Actually, your um, the pattern you mentioned is exactly what what we observed too. Is at the very beginning when we were pretty early on into remote learning, there was a ton of frustration because of poor, you know, access hurdles, poor, you know, the, the high learning curve, let's face it, to, to really get um, content out of Hathi Trust. Uh, but, you know, as we moved on uh, through the, um, through the pandemic and people became more comfortable, or at least I would think it was the option of driving uh, across the valley to, to curbside pickup or finding it in Hathi and, and, and kind of forcing your way into learning how to, how to get around some of the hurdles. Um, usage really skyrocketed, and I have heard a lot of positive things about it. That said, I think this is an opportune moment for um, Hadi Trust to to really um, look at 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 how things are set up and um, and and take what must be a, an immense amount of user um, experience and feedback out there um, for uh, for making improvements. So yeah, I would agree. I think it's been a lifesaver, but. Um, certainly not without a lot of issues and even access issues for people who returned overseas, et cetera. I've heard some stories from our graduate students and international students as well. So um, far from perfect, but again, for us, it covered a lot of content that wasn't available to some folks uh, at all. So it was a help. And I'll just add one more quick thing there that even when we reopened the library in August, we opted 
to keep ETAS on with permission from, from Hati. Um, and those books are not circulating. And that was a decision we made because we don't have everyone on campus. And it was an equity decision that rather than prioritizing print access for those who were on campus, we wanted to keep open the, um, the remote access. So I think there is, there is a lot to look at here. I don't think um, Hati could have asked for a better uh, user immersion than what they've just gotten. And I hope that they run with it and, and, and do some good things. Uh, it's worth mentioning um, before we move to the next question, uh, and I'm mindful that this is recorded, but I do wonder whether we have a particular, we have a potential sci hub issue in the offing. Uh, the people who I know who are the greatest users and the most efficient users of Hathi Trust have engineered ways to extract more content from it than I think the users have envisioned. Um, and I, I would wonder what part of the adoption curve app, in fact represents the, dis the dissemination of these scripting techniques that allow you to copy lots of pages um, yeah, in an automated fashion. So uh, worth, worth thinking about if you go back to Hathi Trust. Um, so uh, other questions we've had in the chat. Um, one question we have in the chat is uh, from Tony and Deborah. Uh, the pandemic placed premium, a premium on online resources, but also made accessibility obviously a, a crucial issue. Uh, and in fact, uh, Barbara just spoke to that. One question is how, how are you going to balance that in the future? Uh, the desire to, you know, balancing, you know, getting things online, having e-resources, but being presented with, of course, you know, not letting the perfect be the end of the media good, you know, no, no online resource is especially in its first iteration going to be perfect uh, or maybe perfectly accessible. How, how are you guys going to balance that going forward? Either of you. <laughs> Simon, why don't you go ahead? Well, I'll just, I mean, that's huge. And I think, uh, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that it's absolutely, along with just the kind of um, equity issues that I mentioned earlier. And, you know, it's hard sometimes to unravel or untangle the pandemic from just the social uh, issues that we have also been facing. This has just been an incredible uh, 12 months uh, of social unrest as well as bringing a lot of um, equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, anti-racism, uh, well, racism and anti-racism initiatives to the fore. And the reason I mention that is because we're really starting to wrap in the issue of accessibility into that mix. Uh, where it was sort of these equity, diversity, inclusion issues, and then accessibility. And now I'm seeing more thinking around, wait a minute, accessibility is right in there. And we're, we're, we're having to bring that into the whole mix in terms of our discussion, whether it's planning for new resources. And one thing I'll say is one area where we have done a lot of work at UMass has been on digitization. We've been a long time a high producer proponent of digitization uh, of our collections. And so um, we have been implementing accessibility standards into that um, for quite some time. Uh, it's an area that we can actually control. Uh, as, and then the other approaches, of course, is to be providing feedback um, to vendors, et cetera. Uh, one thing I'll add quickly as well is that as we look at um, our uh, framework for license agreements um, that we have been working, uh, as many libraries have been doing in terms of creating um, a set of uh, standards, if you like, for us uh, when we do work with vendors, accessibility is also being brought into that now. Um, and that's work that's happening right at this moment. And I would say really driven by some of these experiences. Yeah, I'll just add one quick thing that really is something, um, not an original idea to me at all, but was actually something my uh, former colleague at Columbia, Rob Cardellano, some of you may know him, uh, talked a lot about, and that is the difference between what it means to acquire and steward an online resource versus a print resource. So when we buy a print resource, it goes on a shelf and we may track its statistics around circulation, et cetera, but by and large, once that lands in the library, it sort of becomes untethered from the person who brought it into the library. Whereas with online resources, because so many of these issues are coming up around interface, accessibility, um, representation, uh, 
you know, conversations we're having related to DEI and in collections around decolonization and indigenous forms of knowledge, all of these things that that make it an important part of a, a librarian's job to revisit those electronic resources once purchased or licensed, to go back and ensure as we're advocating with our vendors and others, that those resources are keeping pace with the things that we care about, that our scholars care about, and, and that they're in keeping with our values. And so it's a different form of collection stewardship and one that I don't know if we talk that much about. So it's just something to think about as we turn even more towards online resources. What's our responsibility in libraries to make sure that ongoing those online resources are actually evolving in the way that we need them to evolve? interesting it's like the slaughterhouse five if everyone's read that where aliens come down and they see people in four dimensions and so they begin small and get big and so that you know to see a, a library resource really through time uh, is an interesting question jeremy uh we're you know we're i'm just cycling through and there's a lot of activity in the chat and uh i i feel a little bit like that saturday night live uh skit where there's um one guest is ahead by five minutes and one guest is behind the moderator by five minutes. So I'm definitely behind the chat by five minutes. But Jeremy, I think, was, was on deck. Jeremy? Uh, thank you, David, and, and thanks um, to the presenters. Uh, I'd like to go back to diversity, equity, and inclusion. There have been a number of statements um, in the late spring and summer from librarian organizations about this, um, focused on the global south, but a lot, a lot of these issues extend to European publications, frankly, to um, non-online accessibility and what happens when budgets are diminished and um, what happens when there possibly is e-preferred also. Um, Barbara mentioned um, the problem of APCs for the Global South, which is true. And um, we also heard um, about collaborative collection development for um, some countries like Brazil and Mexico. Um, I'm wondering what other approaches or what other things should we be thinking about as far as the effects of um, or looking, looking toward the future of a reduced budget, increased online aspect as we still try to collect Global South, but also Europe, especially Eastern Europe, uh, and classics publications in these places. Uh, are there things that we should be looking to do? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I know Jay is on this call and she's so much more the expert to answer this question, Jay and Colin and, and others here than I am. Um, but I, I'll just take a quick stab and then Simon, I'll, I'll, have, I'll turn it over to you. I think um, one aspect of collaborative collecting that I kind of hinted at, but I think we could come back to a little bit is that by ensuring that we provide access to materials our scholars need, um, it does free up budget to a certain extent. Now, if there are extreme budget cuts and tons of constraint, it just it doesn't do that. It just lets us meet the constraints that we have. But if we can continue to explore ways in which to share purchasing and find pockets of money, um, I think a very important aspect of spending that money is to think about the kinds of materials that I know in area studies or global studies are really hard to come by through normal, pub, not normal, but the commercial publishing um, enterprises, the, you know, the, the fact that we need to go to parts of the world to get important research materials. I think if we can begin to, to acknowledge that there's a different form of collecting for different parts of the world and support that with any savings, I think that's really important to do. That um, sometimes we paint collecting as, with a broad brush and ignore the fact that um, you need to be on the ground in places to get a lot of these really important collections. So, you know, again, it's about your financial situation, but ideally we, for the things that are published by the Oxford University Press, we get a, a copy of that and we make sure it's accessible or the number of copies we need for the regional institutions we support and hopefully can move some of that money to the harder to collect things from other parts of the world. That's just, it's a thought, but Simon, I'd love to hear your thought. Yeah, I mean, I'm in, I'm in an institution that is not going to be doing a lot of comprehensive collection development in some of those areas, although we are definitely 
looking at open content. Um, somebody raised, like I just saw a flash in chat, uh, even Latin American content in, um, in Hadi Trust, but also uh, they have been actually uh, in many ways a, a lot further ahead uh, in areas like open access and open content. Um, and I think that's just, that is gonna have to be part of our future if we're gonna be looking at a more uh, globally, more equitable access to this research because I'm viewing this, the question a little more, uh, not just us acquiring or us getting access, but also the sharing of our research and our knowledge in a, in a more global um, way. And I certainly know libraries have been thinking about this, MIT and others have been very vocal about the need for us to be thinking uh, open science, Barbara brought up earlier on. Um, so I think all of these things, I mean, it's easy to say open access is the, the solution. It's, it's part of the solution. It's not going to be entirely the solution, but I think there are going to be ways that we can agitate for, I think, more around the sharing uh, through our repositories um, and other ways of getting that content out. I know, I know statistically the use of our repository by um, researchers and students in other parts of the world, the, the numbers really are quite high. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's paths toward making our, our content um, more openly accessible too. So I kind of see that question coming in both directions. Okay, we're, we're, at, uh, we're at the end of our time. I guess I'd like to ask um, just to, as a sign off, sort of like they do with Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me or something like that, where they ask you a, a quick question about the future. Um, I think if you, either of you could give a quick sort of answer because this is the AIA SCS. What is, do you think, given the trends that you see and where libraries are going, what should a department like classics or archaeology or Near Eastern studies, what, what is that? So either answer, what would be the best thing for them to do when thinking about interacting with these trends with the libraries? Is it helping to create, you know, is it creating online educational resources because the libraries want to support that? Is it, you know, what is the best way? Because we're, we're little fish in an increasingly large pond. And so how, where do we fit into this ecosystem? The other question you could answer if you prefer, since you, you, you may not have thought much about classics is, what do you think the biggest budget change is going to be in the next two years based on COVID? Because you guys have talked a lot about things that could require resources. So yeah. I'll jump in very quickly on that first question, David, because I think it's a really great question. And one of the ways I think that folks in classics and archeology span and other areas, and I, I use this thinking of some wonderful examples from my my faculty colleagues at uh, UMass is to uh, see the libraries as a real partner in redefining the notion of scholarship and what those scholarly outputs really look like. We all know about digital scholarship and digital humanities and really making that output and that content uh, really highly recognized and, and rewarded from sort of the uh, tenure and promotion perspective. So um, I think there's so much work to be done there and libraries are, are really well poised to help um, uh, push the model, I guess, and, and um, push the boundaries of that model. So that's something I'm really excited about um, when I think about those smaller disciplines who are doing really, really innovative work. Um, and we can help really celebrate and highlight that. Yeah, I, I would totally second that, Simon. I think you've you've hit it. And I, and I might even push it a little further and think about your library, um, if you're if you're in, on faculty in, in in a smaller humanities department, think about your library as a potential partner in recruitment um, for the the graduate students who have interest in this um, in, in in new forms of scholarship and in, in new um, new methods and tools, um, and really in, and then think about how again as I said earlier you might work together on graduate training that you know in some ways can the library be an extension of your department in terms of of training scholarly dissemination, you know, just all of the kinds of things that I think libraries are so well poised to do. So I, I think that that is really, um, really the, the thing to think about. Um, and gosh, on that budget question, that's a really tough one, because I think it's really contextual, David, I think depends on, on your environment and in the financial pressures you faced before the pandemic. But I think 
pretty, I think one thing is worth putting together our FY22 budget is anything that we've introduced in terms of collections and services online during the pandemic, it's gonna be very hard to take them away post pandemic. And so this is a moment budgetarily, depending on your situation of how to think about the additional costs of the pandemic going forward. And if that is additive, <laughs> And then what does that mean about what you stop doing? And that I think is gonna be some of the harder work we do financially in the coming months. Yes, and that's why you guys are the ULs and I can ask the questions and I don't have to make any of the tough choices. So uh, please, uh, uh, although the, uh, many people are still here, uh, which is really wonderful. I was very pleased to be able to bring this to both classicists, archeologists and, and librarians and, and all sorts of uh, fields. But let's everyone thank uh, Simon and Barbara for having such an open, uh, wonderful, uh, well-researched discussion online. I learned a ton and thank you so much. I know um, I have recorded this. I will be in discussion with Simon and Barbara about uh, what form, if any, we can make it available and accessible. Uh, it needs to be transcribed and all that. So we'll, uh, we'll achieve that balance if we can. And uh, I'll certainly be letting people know if, if this will be found someplace. But I uh, hope you all have a, a wonderful SCS. Please come uh, join us at the, um, you know, the forum for classics, libraries, and scholarly communications. Uh, and um, I look forward to seeing what Jeremy and Megan do going over the next year. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great meeting. And thank you, Barbara and Simon, once more. It was wonderful.